Let us discuss the purpose of life. This is the most important topic that we could ever discuss. It should put everything that we do into perspective. That requires many questions and we would hope for rational answers. We don't know, that means we can be in the position of agnosticism, the general acceptance that we don't know and the agnostic approach is that we cannot know. But I'm going to take the approach that we certainly can know. So how we can move from a, a general sense of agnosticism to a serious spiritual commitment. Obviously, from my appearance, I represent a spiritual tradition. So I'm going to be talking in ultimately in uh, spiritual terms, but I want to approach this in a, in a rational manner, not a dogmatic manner. Uh, agnosticism is based on the presumption that we can re never really understand anything fully. And on a sp spiritual path requires spiritual uh, commitment based on the assumption or understanding that beyond normal sphere of knowledge, that which is acquired through seeing, touching, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling through our senses and digesting all this and making speculations upon this with our mind, there is a level of sublime consciousness that can be approached by a spiritual path. Now, when we say uh, spiritual, a lot of people get turned off right away, or even more so by the word religious. Many people who consider themselves to be rational get turned off by this. But I want to approach this in a uh, rational way. Respecting the intelligence of people who are intelligent enough to make such inquiries into the purpose of life. Obviously, uh, I'm not going to say, well, the purpose of life is to make lots of money. We wouldn't need a big discussion uh, if, that was, if that was the conclusion. There might be a big discussion how to make lots of money, but that the goal of life is to make lots of money. Uh, I'm not going to discuss, although possibly in the modern age, people who are in the garb of spiritualists, they do teach such things, but such people are not real spiritualists at all. So we're going to discuss the purpose of life in a, a rational, intelligent way for people who are serious to understand this subject and who have higher aspirations than simply earning money, uh, having a so-called good time, mindless living. So uh, I'm going to discuss this in terms of the spiritual tradition, the Vaishnav tradition, to which uh, I have been committed for the last 37 years. But I'm not going to do so in a dogmatic way or ask anyone to accept anything out of blind faith. We want to respect the intelligence of any person who is intelligent enough to make such inquiries. Of course, there are many intelligent people in the world who don't make such inquiries, who are using their intelligence for making more and more machines, uh, techn technological objects, like the technology by which you're able to hear this amplified and to uh, see this broadcast on the internet. So there are certainly many intelligent people in 
the world, but、uh, most people are simply using their intelligence without having considered the really most、uh, important question of the, well, what is everything all about anyway? We live in, we live in an age in which people are rushing, 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 without thinking, where are we going? We're so busy making more things and earning more money, and or just trying to end. Make ends meet. That why we're doing what we're doing, we never stop to consider. It's a herd mentality that because everyone else lives life in a certain way, we also do. But real intelligence means to、uh, sit quietly, consider, contemplate, it, and consider where have we come from, where are we going to, what. Is everything all about anyway?、Uh, rather than sh- just living without any clearly defined purpose or program, and just going on in the way that everyone does so, without thinking. So we congratulate people who are、uh, interest in, interested in、uh, finding out or inquiring into. The sublime purpose of life. I'm going to quote from Bhagavad Gita. Now you may think, well, that's dogmatic, but it's not because it's a, you can judge for yourself that this is a statement which、uh, anyone can、uh, ascertain without it being a religious dogmatic statement. The statement is Manusha nang sahasreshu kasthyatiti sidhiye. Out of thousands of persons, maybe only one person will be interested in spiritual perfection. So that's at the best of times, and what to speak of in our modern, highly materialistic age. Now, everyone has a purpose of life, whether they sit down and think about it.、Uh, Or not, whether whether they define it in their mind,、uh, everyone has some purpose of life. Most people don't think about it, but we are purpose-driven beings. Everything we do is for some purpose. In fact, every living being, not only human beings, we can say that every living being, everything they do. At every moment, is for the purpose of、uh, increasing their comforts, their pleasure, their happiness, and minimizing discomfort or anything that may cause them、uh, any pain. And that may be extended also, not simply for one's own immediate personal happiness, but one may act for the happiness of one's. Family members, one's friends, one's nation, but at every moment, we, even subliminally, we make decisions about what to do based on the principle of: Will this be better for me and those I consider dear to me, or not?、Uh, and usually that. Or at the lowest level of consciousness, that decision is made in terms of what pleasure I can get from my senses. So everyone is trying to get free from suffering and to be happy always.、Uh, and what are the basic activities that people do for that? Eating, sleeping, copulating. And warding off all obstacles to their doing so. So again, quoting from、uh, Vedic literature: Ahara nidra bhaya maitu namcha samanya metat pasu bhinaranam. Again, this is not a sectarian or dogmatic statement. It simply states that eating, sleeping, fearing, and mating. 
these four activities both humans and animals do. And the rest of the statement is dharmo hitesham adhiko vishesham dharmena hina pashubhinaranam that dharma is the special prerogative of human life. Dharma is uh, roughly translated as religion. So without dharma, which is not possible to conceive of in subhuman life, in animal life, a human is nothing more than an animal. It's simple arithmetic. A plus B equals C, C minus B equals A. Animal plus the animal propensities plus dharma makes a human being. So a human being without dharma is simply a two-legged animal. It may be a harsh judgment, but it's quite rational. So what is dharma? It's roughly translated as religion. It's uh, one of those non-translatable terms. There are many such non-translatable terms from the Vedic Sanskrit language into English. It, it doesn't translate very easily because the uh, spiritual conceptualization is actually uh, far more developed and profound in the Sanskrit language. Dharma is sometimes translated as religion. Uh, it's sometimes understood to be a sense of order uh, in the universe uh, or to be in harmony with that order. Uh, certainly without it, um, one is no more than an animal. So and dharma is a very big subject. It's uh, religion in uh, Vedic culture takes uh, many different forms and is uh, often misunderstood as uh, being polytheistic or chaotic by persons who do not understand the subtleties of it. But the higher levels of dharma begin with atato brahma jignasa. Now one should inquire into Brahma. Brahma is another of those uh, not very easily translatable terms. It means the uh, ultimate spiritual essence. Now one should inquire into the ultimate spiritual essence. Now that one has human life, it's understood that we have come through many, many lives. Now that we have human life, we should inquire into the nature of ultimate reality. This is the uh, quest for the, for the sublime, that for persons who are uh, actually uh, contemplative, who are not satisfied with a life of simply working and making money and the trivialities of this world, the persons who may be interested to listen to a discourse such as this, uh, such persons can intuitively perceive that there is more or there should be more to life than simply getting born, living for some time, having some friends and enemies, uh, having some pleasure and some distress in this world, and then dying. There must be more to it than all of this. That we are meant for divine existence. Now we're talking about intuition here, which may not be, you may say now we've gone beyond the rational, but even in what is considered rational science, any advances, what are considered advances in science, have not come simply from rational consideration of data, but have come from intuition, a sense that beyond what we presently know, there is, a, there is another dimension 
of understanding. There was nothing in science as it was known at the time to suggest relativity theory. But Einstein uh, intuitively he made that step. He, and so how does that come? By science, what we call scientific or rational progress comes by uh, contemplation of what we already know. We, we're dissatisfied. We think it's, it's not a complete enough understanding. And uh, by deep, com deep contemplation, the answer may be revealed to such a person. Revelation. There's some revelation. So, on the, uh, on, the, on the existential level, some intuition of the divine, that there is more to existence than simply eating, sleeping, working, resting, mating, fighting. There's more to life than this triviality. There's the divine dimension. So... Uh, that there is a divine dimension is suggested by the long history of persons who have uh, reported experiences on that platform. Uh, if we reject, there is nothing divine, there is simply the body is chemicals and there is nothing more to it than this. Then we reject the... Uh, the teachings and the realizations of all great spiritual teachers of the past, and we reject all emotions, all feelings, all desires, even the desire to understand the purpose of life. We suggest we reject this as simply being some trans, some chemical transformations within the brain. So, uh, although we may not be able to prove the spiritual dimension according to material science, <coughs> does not mean that it does not exist. In fact, the very nature of a spiritual dimension is, uh, by very definition, not definable in material terms. If we say we can't understand spirit we never we never measured a spirit or we never saw we never saw, saw tasted heard smell or touch spirit with our material senses well that's to be expect, expected because spirit by its very definition is non-material so uh, later uh, in another session I'd uh, like to present so a rational approach to understanding the nature of spirit beyond the body, beyond simply the chemicals that make up matter. But uh, as that is, uh, it'll take some time, I'll leave that for another session. But anyway, we're going to take uh, a step into the realm of the divine not not now we're not just entering dogma here we're not asking people to give up their rationalism but we're uh, asking people to at least accept hypothetically that there is such and uh, if we don't accept that then we remain always on the platform of uh, an agnostic which is nothing much more than a cultured animal, sophisticated animal. So for persons who think that's as far as we can go, well, that's as far as you can go. If you, if you want to be only totally rational and only accept that which we can directly perceive, then that, that's called solipsism, in which it's a philosophical understanding or actually not very philosophical understanding is that we only we only accept as being real that which I perceive so uh, I'm looking at someone else but I don't know if you're really real 
But then you might, it might be that even what we perceive is not real. So we, we come to absurd positions in which we if, we, if we want to accept only what we can perceive as being real, then we come to a position of absurdity which is totally unpragmatic. And in fact, even to think that, well, I only can, I can only accept as being real that which I can perceive, you have to think in terms of language, which you learn from someone else, and from others. So it's not a very tenable philosophical position. Uh, anyway, let's go on. What is the purpose of life? Uh, that there is a purpose of life is suggested by the universe being so ordered that there are laws of nature that we can analyze the universe in scientific terms suggests that it is uh, that there is a purpose of life there's no appar no one makes an apparatus for no purpose if you go to an inventor's convention and someone presents here is a wonderful machine you see you just push a button and the flaps open it makes a little noise and lights blink you say, well, yeah, that's very good. What does it do? Well, it doesn't do anything. It has no particular purpose, but it's a machine. But what is the use of such an invention? Why, why should anyone uh, expend their intelligence and their energy and their money into creating a, a complex apparatus that does nothing? It has no, no particular function. It may do something, but it has no particular function. So the fact that the universe uh, is, is so superbly ordered and so uh, finely ordered that we as humans uh, consider ourselves advanced to the degree that we can have some insights into the order of the universe, but however much we research it, in, v in various fields, we find that there's always much, much more to learn. So, s uh, such a vast apparatus has no purpose. Doesn't seem to make sense, does it? And <coughs> the very fact that we are purpose-driven beings also suggests that there's purpose. Just like if you're thirsty, it suggests that, well, you have a need to drink something. So if we have a, 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 this impelling motive that to find out the purpose of life, or that even if our purpose of life is just to make money, that we are purpose-driven driven beings suggests that there is purpose. There is an anecdote told about Isaac Newton. I don't know if it's true or not, but I've heard it many times. But whether it's true or not, it serves this anecdote, serves a purpose. That uh, Isaac Newton being a, a theist uh, also had an agnostic friend. So, uh, once the agnostic friend of Isaac Newton visited Sir Isaac's home and saw therein a, uh, an apparatus of, of a, a moving model of the universe as it was understood at that time. <clears throat> so, turn the handle and all the planets started to move and the friend was very impressed. That was cutting-edge stuff at the time. Well, that was ahead of the times at the time. So, uh, then, the friend asked Sir Isaac that, well, this is remarkable. Did you make this or someone else made it? Who made it? And Sir I said, well, no one made it. It's just 
happens to be there. And his friend said, Come on, what are you talking about? Who made it? He said, no, 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 I made it. Just, you know, just happens to be there. I just came into my lab one day and just happens to be there. Well, someone must have put it there. Someone must have made it. Sir Isaac said, yeah, well, I, I, surely someone must have made it, but this is only a very uh, crude model of the universe, and you don't accept that the real universe has a maker. So in this way he exposed. Sir, Sir Isaac exposed the agnostic as his theory of that there is no but we cannot know if there is any maker or controller of the universe, he exposes theory. Now, um, here, is, here, my dear friends, is a uh, cheap Casio watch with only half a strap, because I find it convenient to put it like that, and I can see it. Whereas if the whole strap's there, it doesn't sit nicely like that. So it's a uh, use purpose or, or modified design. See, I took one half the strap off. Okay, this is a Casio watch. Uh, now, it's quite complex, somewhat complex. I wouldn't know how to make one. It's not nearly as complex as the universe, but if I was to propound that, it came into being out of nothing or that just, there was a big storm, Isaac, there's a big storm, Isaac, Isaac, going on at the time. Uh, and there were some bits and pieces of plastic lying in the yard and some bits and pieces of iron filings. And when the storm was over, here we go. Casio watch with only half a strap, just like that, exactly to the point, just exactly according to my need. Well, if I claim that, probably the Casio company would sue me. But it's an absurd claim that this little watch can come into being without a lot of effort. Now, if we think what effort goes into making this, and someone had to design it, and then even the quality of steel and plastic, different kinds of plastic. There's one kind of plastic on the face, another kind of plastic on the strap. So all the different components required a lot of research, to, and then the exact design, and then uh, extracting the iron ore, discovering where it is, extracting it, uh, making such a watch, marketing it, uh, fixing a price so that you it will sell well, but you make the company makes enough profit and all this so much intelligence goes into something which is we just take it as a, an everyday artifact. Just we don't think twice about it. It's some little watch and okay, watch the time. Time to finish this lecture. Uh, so if we say that, or if we can understand that even this little watch, which is quite complex to the layman, cannot come, but cannot come into being simply by chance. It requires much intelligence and much effort to do so. Then how can we accept that the universe comes into being by chance. It's not a very good hypothesis. A much better hypothesis that hypothesis is that it is purpose built by a designer. So that's a very common argument for the existence of the purposeful being uh, who makes the universe, and I'll speak more about this later. In the last talk, we came to the point by 
simple logic that the universe is ordered which strongly suggests that there is a purpose to it and that there is a uh, an orderer a contr a controller behind it all now the staunch atheist or the staunch agnostic of course an agnostic shouldn't be staunch but they should be willing to accept if there's good knowledge they should be willing to accept it they will say well you can't prove it <clears throat> that's true but on the other hand there are many things that can't be proved in what in the science that they almost religiously uh, adhere to or support. <coughs> so it, it's really a matter of where to place one's faith. Faith is there for everyone. We we can't prove everything. We have faith. We, we have faith in what scientists say, sometimes it's wrong. Just like uh, for many years they were, they were warned by representatives of the medical profession not to spend too much time in the sun because there's a danger of skin cancer. And myself and many others following that uh, later found that there's more danger of bone depletion from not getting enough vitamin D so we're suffering from that. So uh, they often get it wrong, uh, but still we have to go on with faith. Unless we have faith, we can't live. We can't. We'll be. We may be afraid to breathe in air. Maybe the air is poison. Maybe the water is poison. We don't know. What are we going to do? Scientifically test it? We have to have faith in the scientific method of testing. So you have to put your faith somewhere. We all do so. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, practically what it comes to is that we, we can't go through all the rigid, logical arguments for or against any position. Maybe some people can. They, they get paid in the university to, dis, to be philosophy professors, but there aren't many of them. But even in the field of philosophy, that you can just go on and on and on. There's no end. You can always bring up arguments and counter arguments. But practically speaking, this cannot satisfy the soul or give us any real direction in life. Therefore, what everyone does is to follow some intuition also. Even those who are uh, <coughs> doggedly atheistic, they are so, uh, more so by intuition, even though they may say it's rational or whatever, but it's more so by intuition. They, they have a feeling that it's like that, uh, that there is no God in control and that we're just uh, creature. The life is simply a result of matter. In the next talk I give, I want to speak about a rational approach to spiritualism, how we can uh, understand that there is spiritual reality by very simple rational methods. <clears throat> so uh, it is, we can say it's a matter of faith to accept that there is a supreme controller, a supreme power, uh, but it's not totally irrational faith. It's not an unintelligent faith to think so. Just like to think that uh, a watch has a maker, even though one doesn't have direct evidence of a particular watch, uh, having been made by intelligent beings, it's actually unintelligent to think that there is no man. There is no uh, intelligence and design behind it. 
And even uh, atheistic scientists talk about nature's design. Now, what does that mean? As, is nature a, a, a completely impartial, unmotivated force? Just so by saying nature's design, that implies uh, intelligence, which implies a personality behind it all. So where is this all leading us to? It's leading us to what has led many scientists who were trained in atheism. I and mean, it's not directly part of orthodox science, but it's the, the uns, unspoken underlying principle uh, that in science we don't discuss that there is any supernatural forces. They've, they've just decided as an axiom between them all that there's nothing supernatural, which is not very rational. Why should there not be? Why should all of reality uh, be what we can observe? It's actually much more rational to presume that there are forces which are beyond our normal power of observation, because our normal powers of observation are very limited. We only see within limited spectrum, we only hear within, within a limited spectrum. We can only uh, think within certain spectrum of our, of our uh, experience. So why should we consider that we as tiny living beings can, uh, that, that all of knowledge is within the scope of what we can observe and speculate about. That's not very intelligent, even to think like that. It's more intelligent, more reasonable to uh, accept that there are many kinds of energies and powers beyond that which we can normally think about. Now, uh, as I just said, many uh, scientists who started off as uh, skeptical about any metaphysical entities or existence, by studying science have come to the conclusion that there is intelligent design, which their opponents within the scientific world say is covered theism. Uh, but they've come to that conclusion by seeing the uh, extraordinary complexity of nature, even at the microscopic level, and concluding that this simply could not have come into being by chance. There must be some intelligent design behind it. Which, as the uh, atheistic scientists say, it leads to theism. Well, so be it. <laughs> now, uh, interestingly, persons who come to this conclusion, they tend to, at this point, gravitate toward the uh, religious culture of the country in which they are raised. In other, so we find. Uh, videos of Islamic preachers talking all about science and this and that and then coming to the conclusion Allah and we find Christian preachers talking about science and coming to the conclusion Jesus so they make a leap of faith, having come to the conclusion that there should be some intelligent designer, then uh, at that point it seems their rational faculties get suspended and they just jump. So, well, if there's God, it must be, and what, fill in the blank according to whatever culture you are raised in. Uh, But, why? <laughs> they make a leap of faith. A leap of faith, maybe that may be required, but look before you leap. That's another saying. Leap of faith is one saying. Look before you leap, 
is another thing. Uh, why should the rational faculties be suspended at this point and just, well, if there's God, then it must be the God of the Bible or the God of the Quran. And I suspect that much of the resistance of atheistic scientists toward intelligent design theory, well, a lot of it is just due to uh, bias or, or that they have a certain worldview which they're attached to, which they don't want to see punctured. Uh, but another reason is that if they think that well, now we have to accept the dogmas that science has rejected for hundreds of years and we have to go back to some uh, dogmatic understanding of some God who chucks people into hell if they don't believe in him. It, it's, and, and all that uh, these religions have done throughout the years it's in, in the name of God, all the uh, horrific things which have been perpetrated in the name of religion and the, the exploitation that has gone on in the name of religion. And I suspect that many people who, even faced with very good scientific argu arguments for intelligent design, reject it because if the conclusion is that you have to go back to this uh, sorry to say but practically barbaric culture that has come up in the name of God and religion then uh, they'd rather be blind atheists than intelligent theists uh, so is there an alternative to this this uh, when I say barbaric culture some people may be shocked but if you see the history of religion in much of the world. It is a history of uh, inquisitions, jihads, crusades, and so on. And uh, even today, uh, literally millions of creatures are slaughtered daily. There's a daily holocaust going on due to uh, or, or backed up by, by the interpretation of the biblical statement that God gave man dominion over all the creatures. So that's interpreted to mean that, okay, cut them up and eat them. So uh, it's religion, there's as it's going on in the, or has gone on for hundreds of years in the Western world, is not very attractive to uh, many people who are otherwise uh, intelligent and consider themselves to be civilized and cultured and wanting the best for the human race. If we, if we uh, see some, we, we don't want to reject all atheists as just being outright ill-motivated, but having seen uh, and seeing all around them the effect of religion, uh, that tends to make them irreligious or, or non-believers, uh, even in the face of good scientific evidence to support the hypothesis of an intelligent designer. So how to get around this? We have on the other, on one hand, science, it seems increasingly, is bringing out strong evidence for intelligent design. And on the other hand, uh, if we have to accept that, then we have to go back to a, it seems we, we have to go back to a religious system that is... Uh, unkind, unintelligent, and dogmatic in as much as it demands blind faith. And then how, if you say, okay, there's an intelligent, intelligent designer, well, do you accept the God of the Quran? If, if you don't, you're in trouble, according to those who, who uh, profess the Quran.
or do you accept the God of the Bible? And if you don't accept that, that God, then you're in trouble according to the, those believers. And it's just based on blind faith. There's no intelligent way to understand uh, which path you should follow. And in fact, blind faith is uh, promoted as a virtue in such religious systems. Whereas people who are uh, intelligent and philosophically inclined, they're repulsed by such a dogmatic approach. So, is there another path to find out what is our purpose? Is there, is there more? Is there, is there a better explanation? Well, let, let's keep on with the rational approach. If we say that, okay, there's a supreme power, it's a leap of faith to accept that, no doubt. But then, otherwise we have to have faith that the universe is meaningless, which uh, is also not very satisfying, and those who are interested to understand the purpose of life, they obviously they're dissatisfied with the non-explanation that the universe is meaningless. So, uh, <clears throat> is, is there a better approach? Well, let's, let's consider, there's a designer, there's a purpose, we are tiny little beings within this universe. Does the designer who set up this world with a purpose, can, can we communicate or can we get knowledge? Does he communicate with us? It's, it's also uh, reasonable to expect that if the designer of this universe set it up with a purpose and we're in it trying to find out what is that purpose, that he has a method or that supreme power has a method of communicating that to us, and that is the scripture. Now, when we say scripture, we, that we know there's the Bible, there's the Jewish Bible, and the Christian Bible, and the, and the or versions of the Bible, there's the Quran, and there are the Vedas. These are the uh, principal scriptures of the world. There are also, there's also Buddhist literature, although the Buddha himself uh, didn't give any scripture and actually gave very little teachings about anything. Uh, <clears throat> later, the, the few uh, teachings that the Buddha gave were added to, and that is uh, what is loosely called Buddhism nowadays. So, uh, scripture means uh, the supreme being's communication with us tiny beings. And all scripture, uh, or all religious systems, they address questions uh, such as, why are we here? Why is there suffering? How can we attain eternal happiness? However, uh, some of these scriptures and the traditions that have developed from them uh, approach these subjects in a more thorough way than do others, just as there is a pocket dictionary which gives the main definitions of the main words in the English language, if we're talking about the English language, and then we have very big dictionaries, encyclopedic dictionaries, which give uh, the all different meanings of words, including archaic words and uh, archaic usages, the etymology, they give examples of usage, and in uh, some cases they'll give, uh, necessarily they'll give more inf information that becomes an encyclopedic dictionary, just like in an encyclopedic dictionary. Uh, it's not enough just to say, just to define what Mount Rushmore is. You have to give more information for people uh, like myself from uh, born in England, haven't spent much time in America, and I just found out the other day what is this, it's not just any old mountain but it's a mountain with the carvings, huge carvings of the faces of four of the prominent 
uh, ex-presidents of the United States of America on, uh, on the side of the mountain. So an encyclopedic dictionary will give more information like this, and necessarily it becomes very big, and there's lots of information in there about all kinds of things, and uh, in this way, one can get more information than the basic inf information. One can get more information from the encyclopedic dictionary than from the pocket dictionary. So, uh, some scriptures have a very basic approach and others uh, have a more comprehensive approach. Now, uh, there is a religious system which addresses the problem of suffering. Why is there suffering in the world? There is a religious system which many people adhere to, which states, or which professes that because someone a long time ago ate a fruit, uh, that is the cause of all the suffering in the world since then. Which is not a very uh, satisfying answer to anyone with uh, an intelligence more than that which is willing to accept uh, statements on blind faith. It, it certainly doesn't answer the question, well, why would any God who is kind do that to all of us? Uh, uh, although that is answered again by he sent his only begotten son to redeem us. But then it leaves so many questions unanswered. I don't have, I'm not here to bash any religious system, but we have to consider intelligently. There are many questions unanswered, and therefore the Catholic Church at one point invented the theories of limbo and purgatory, and then the, those theories have been retired now, and you get into many philosophical problems when you uh, espouse uh, theories which are uh, not actually very tenable. So, um, I am following the Vaishnava tradition based on the Vedas of India, of which the essence is the Bhagavad Gita, which has a very different approach. It doesn't ask for blind faith, but rather the speaker of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, who is himself recognized in the Vedas as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he does not demand blind faith, but he convinces his disciple, Arjuna, by intelligent explanation why one should, uh, or how one can understand the nature of spirit, the nature of the Supreme Spirit, why there is suffering in this world, how we can attain eternal happiness, uh, how this world is going on under the direction of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and so on. It's a very different approach in as much as Arjuna is first asked to understand and then to uh, place his, uh, or to take full shelter in Krishna. Now, even in the beginning, there has to be some basic faith. If in the beginning we reject, oh, I, I, I don't accept any of this, then we can't learn. And that's true in any subject. If you go into a classroom, in a college, uh, I sometimes give the example from my own life, studying mathematics in school, and we'd been through algebra, geometry, trigonometry, all these things, and then one day the teacher comes in the classroom and puts this big line on the big squiggle on the board and with some uh, other algebraic looking symbols and we didn't know what it was. He was introducing us to calculus and in the beginning it seemed very difficult but we had faith that the teacher was not just putting some squiggle on the board, that because we had faith that because we didn't understand it, it doesn't mean 
that that squiggle, what to us looks like a squiggle, that it is meaningless. We, we accepted, and the students in the class, of which I was one, we accepted that we don't understand it. To us it just looks like a squiggle, but obviously the teacher does understand it, and he can make us understand also, if we listen attentively and try to understand. But if from the beginning we thought, what's all this, just some squiggle, because we don't understand it, we, we say, oh, it's all meaningless. If we had such an attitude, we could have never learned. So some initial faith is required that there is uh, more than simply the humdrum existence of eating, sleeping, fighting, mating, that there is a sublime purpose to life. This faith is required. That there is a rea reality that is ultimately good. That faith is required. Uh, and actually, even persons who profess to be atheists, they also um, indirectly subscribe to a uh, metaphysical approach to life in as much as they recognize that there is good and bad. If you, even if you're an atheist, if you say something is good and something is bad, then that is a metaphysical statement. Because if you think that, well, everything's just chemicals, then if, what's good or bad about chemicals? To, uh, to mug an old woman in a dark alley and take away her money, that's very bad. But if you say, well, the old woman's just, a, it's just chemicals anyway, so what difference does it make? Well, who will accept such a statement? So uh, everyone indirectly, directly or indirectly, ascribes to a metaphysical outlook on life, and some uh, just directly accept it, and uh, that's all. Just the acceptance that there is good and bad, that in itself suggests that there is a higher moral order. But what is that? Uh, the Bhagavad Gita, I am suggesting to you. To me it's not, it's gone beyond suggestion. I accept it because I've practiced according to that for uh, many years. And I can see the practical effect in my life that this provides uh, spiritual no knowledge. Spiritual knowledge means what is the nature of spirit, which begins with what is the difference between a living body and a dead body. If we say it's all chemicals, then uh, if, if life is only chemicals, then we should not lament for people who die. And that's actually the very first teaching of Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, those who are wise do not lament for uh, the body which comes and goes. But they know that the body is temporary, but the soul is eternal. So that is the first teaching of Bhagavad Gita. And in the Vedic knowledge teaches us that as living beings, our very nature is to be satchitananda. We are meant to be, or we are by nature, eternal, conscious, and joyful. But in this material world, we find that our situation is that we are uh, taking body after body. We have short lives. We are not happy. Or at least, at the very least, we can say our happiness is extremely limited and mixed with much suffering, such as birth, death, old age, and disease. These are all states of suffering. And our consciousness is very limited. We don't know who we are, where we're going, what the purpose of life is, how we got in this situation. The ultimate reality is Satyadananda and uh, is satyam shivam sundaram. The ultimate reality is uh, all truth, all beneficial, all kind, and all beautiful. So that supreme truth is Krishna, 
we all have a, an eternal relationship with that supremely beautiful, supremely blissful, supremely kind personality of Godhead. And to rediscover that relationship is the purpose of life. Now, uh, again, when we come to that which is beyond that which we can directly measure, some measure of faith is required. But, again, so that means intuition also. But that God is kind, I didn't use the word God until now. God is kind, God is merciful, God is loving, God uh, wants the best for us, God is beautiful. Uh, this, uh, we come into it. Otherwise, we have to come to the conclusion that life is meaningless. Uh, but then, uh, that's, that, that happiness that we search, then the natural tendency for us to search for happiness, we either become, we completely lose that and become completely skeptical, or we simply search for happiness in that uh, which animals search for it in, in food and sleep and sex and maybe even lower than the animals in intoxication. So uh, that the purpose of life is to find that situation where we have, where we are eternally happy. Uh, that is a good theory, which if we practice through the, the method given in Bhagavad Gita and the Vedic literature, we find that we actually come to that platform and that we are saying this is a more complete process than other theistic processes that is based on the knowledge that is given and also that the element of uh, malice is completely absent. The, the idea that others are all going to hell eternally, that is absent. The Supreme gives us many chances. If we make a mistake one time, in one lifetime, He'll give us many chances until we finally get it right. So this is a more, uh, this is a reasonable approach or by which we, it, it doesn't uh, insult our intelligence or turn off our intelligence to accept there is a supreme being we are, who is supremely good. The ultimate is good. The ultimate reality is beautiful. The ultimate reality is all beneficial. And our relationship to the supreme being is one of love. Love means between persons. So the Supreme Being is the supremely attractive personality of Godhead called Krishna. Maybe called by different names in different cultures, but Krishna is the complete and perfect name because it means all attractive. And what is that love? Generally love is conceived of as a relationship between uh, two persons in which they both try to help each other uh, enjoy themselves. But selfless and true and complete love is one in which one completely gives one to the other without any expectation of return. So that is the uh, platform on which one can experience the truest love and the highest love. And when one expects nothing for oneself in relationship to Krishna, Krishna who is full and complete, completely fills our heart with pure, uh, blissful, love of himself. So this is a very great subject, which I won't speak of more now, but I will speak of more later. And many others are also speaking of this. It's, it's a great discovery for the uh, Western world of this great uh, technique of s spiritual understanding. Just like uh, America is so much developed technologically, so much developed for enjoying the senses. There are so many arrangements for that. So 
the ancient culture of India was highly developed in spiritual knowledge and spiritual techniques. And the essence of that, spiritual knowledge and spiritual techniques and spiritual understanding are now available to people all over the world. That process is called bhakti or bhakti yoga, the yoga of loving devotion. So there's a, an overview of that and there's much, much more to be said. This is just an introduction.